Hey everybody, it's Lon Sybin. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up and we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about today, including the merger, so to speak, of Thunderbolt and USB. We're gonna look at millions cutting the cord in 2018 and what that really means for big cable companies like Comcast. Nintendo scales back their in-app purchases and their mobile games. We're gonna look at my MacBook Pro two years later. A viewer wanted to know how it's doing in the long run. We'll look at end of life and landfills and setting up your own VPN. Lots to talk about today, so let's get to it. Now, before we begin, I want to thank our newest supporter on the channel, Jim O'Brien, who gave via our donor box page. I want to thank Jim and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis, along with everyone who watches on an ongoing basis, too, because all of those things equal channel growth. So let's take a look now at the week in review. I was busy on the Extras channel this week. We uploaded three videos there. One is a mini review of a little charger that I got in through the Amazon Vine program that I thought was interesting. Uh, we also took a look at Akidio's Thunderbolt 3 Ethernet adapter that supports the 10 gigabit standard. The unboxing was on the Extras channel and the full review was up this week on the main channel. And we also unboxed the GPD Micro PC which I am liking quite a bit. And you can see a full review of all of that stuff uh, on the main channel. And we have a master playlist down below in the video description to find all of these videos. We also looked at Synology's product line and I talked about some of the things that you get uh, with a plus version of their NAS devices and the price differential between the plus devices and the devices that sit just below it on their product line is fairly minimal, but you do get a much more robust feature set. So if you're curious about uh, what all these different Synology devices do. You might want to check out that video. And then on the networking thing, I've got a few more things I want to do with this because a few folks had written in with some suggestions as to why the uh, data transmitting back to my computer over the 10 gig network we set up was a little less than what we were sending out. And it might be due to the MTU settings on that other Mac over there. So I'm going to play around with it. And if I'm able to get it to work, I'll put an update over on the Extras channel in a little bit. But if you're curious as to what a 10 gigabit network is like, you can check out that video and see for yourself. And now it's time for some things in the news that caught my eye. And this was a big story from the USB Promoter Group. The USB 4 specification has been announced and it will include now Thunderbolt 3 as part of the specification. So this means that if you in the future buy a USB 4 computer, it will work with this new 40 gigabit standard, which is actually the old Thunderbolt 3 standard. So all the old Thunderbolt 3 devices will work with your USB 4 computer. And I suspect that we'll see a lot more uh, USB 4 devices that support the 40 gigabit speed moving forward that I think will probably cost a lot less now too because we'll have a wider market now available and hopefully it'll be a little less confusing for consumers as well. And the good news here also is that a 40 gigabit per second USB 4 device should also work on an older Thunderbolt 3 device too. So there's forward and backward uh, compatibility here, which is also good to see. So we'll have to keep an eye on this and see what develops. One thing that won't go away for consumers though is confusion over cables. So we're still gonna stick with the USB Type-C connector, but not all cables will be created equal. So some will be able to handle this 40 gigabit per second operation, uh, some will not. So you have to get a certified 40 gigabit cable. And we already have now, of course, 10 gigabit certified cables that are different than the five gigabit cables. And then there are even some USB-C cables that operate at USB 2.0 speeds. None of that's gonna change. So definitely keep an eye on the certifications on the uh, cables that you're purchasing moving forward here. But I am encouraged to see a merger of these two great standards. And our next story comes from Deadline.com and you can see the article linked on screen here. Uh, they are writing about a study that found 3 million pay TV subscribers cut their service in 2018, which was double what happened in 2017. And if you dive a bit deeper into the article, it says that a bulk of the cord cutters came from satellite distributors like DirecTV and Dish Network. Uh, they collectively lost 2.36 million customers in 2018, which is significant. Uh, they do, though, offer uh, what they call skinny bundles, which are brought over the internet, and both DirecTV and Sling TV are offering services for that, but they're not picking up as many uh, customers on those services as they're losing on satellite. And that got me to thinking, well, what's Comcast's impact been in all of this? Well, it's actually kind of interesting. So if we look at their most recent quarterly report, which gives you the entire picture for 2018, 
uh, they actually picked up 1.3 million high-speed internet customers in 2018. They picked up 1.1 million in 2017. Uh, they did, though, lose about 344,000 residential video customers. So people are cutting the cord uh, for TV, but keeping the internet cord in place. Uh, and overall, they lost about 370,000 uh, TV customers, if you also account for businesses that were also using Comcast for television. So it doesn't look like Comcast is hurting at all. In fact, I think they're making much more money on those internet pickups than they're losing on the residential losses here because for Comcast, when you pay them for your internet service, they basically can uh, keep all that money. On cable TV, they have to pay out a lot of the money you're paying for your cable TV subscription to the content providers like ESPN and all the other cable networks that you watch. The internet doesn't work that way. In fact, Comcast is working on ways to collect money from the people providing you content over the internet. So this is uh, not bad for them at all because if you are going to cut the cord but you want uh, to watch some TV over the internet, you need an internet connection and they've got the uh, local monopolies to make it happen for you. And in fairness, their service is actually pretty good, at least in my area. Now, of course, I should note that my service from Comcast is really good on the downstream, but not so great on the upstream where I'm still uh, struggling along here at only about 10 megabits per second. One other interesting note from their quarterly earnings release was the fact that they are talking about their transition to a connectivity business uh, versus just being a cable television provider. And clearly this is working well for them. Provide the dumb pipe and make a lot of money off that pipe, which they're doing, uh, is probably the better strategy versus being held hostage by all these content uh, producers like ESPN and others. So it looks like Comcast really is uh, seeing the value here and having that internet connectivity that they can make available to customers. And uh, they are not losing at all uh, in this cord cutting era. Now this week, Nintendo announced that they're going to be curbing their microtransactions in their mobile games to prevent their brand from getting damaged by uh, all this nickel and diming that we've been seeing in the mobile app world. And just last week, right before they announced this, we were talking about how Lemmings, a classic PC game franchise, was totally desecrated by this uh, mobile app developer that actually charges people by the hour to play the game. It's ridiculous, and apparently Nintendo does not want that to happen to them. Uh, so they have uh, ordered their developers who are using their license to be careful about how they charge players to play these games, which is great to see. You can read more about this on Variety. And I wanted to talk about something that I listened to this week in regards to arcade games and how they were developed back in the day and the similarities there are uh, to mobile. So my pick of the week this week is going to be a little bit early in the wrap-up today because I want you to go out and listen to this great interview on the Retronauts uh, with a guy named Mark Turmel, who was a developer on NBA Jam and a number of other games. In fact, he was an Apple II developer. I used to play his games as a little kid. I didn't even know it until I uh, listened to his interview. He used to do stuff for Sirius Software, and one of his games was called Sneakers, which was one of my favorites. And he was talking about how they were designing NBA Jam to basically consume as many quarters as possible and some of the tweaks that they made to the game uh, to make all that happen. So if you've never played NBA Jam before, it's an awesome arcade game. They have some great ports on uh, most of the major consoles from the 90s, and it's a two-on-two -two basketball game that uh, has a lot of fun animation to it, really cool dunks and everything. I just love this game. We used to play it a lot in college. And he was talking about the analytics that they built into the game back in 1991 to help them develop a game that could consume more quarters, but also help the operators to determine what settings they should set the game to to get as much money out of them as possible. And one of the things that Mark Turmel was talking about in the interview was how they were uh, looking at all these game audits that they were collecting when the game was still kind of being trialed at a few arcades as they were completing development on it. And you can see some of the analytics you get out of this machine. How many games were started? How many individual players started? How many people put their initials in versus not? How many people finished the first, second, or third, or fourth quarter? How many went to overtime? All this data, and they were able to uh, figure some things out from watching how people played to determine what would get them to pay more money when the game was finally released. And one of the things he was talking about was some adjustments they made to the game to make the score closer because they found that if the score was too lopsided, either you were losing by a lot or winning by a lot, 
people were walking away from the game. And the way they engineered the game was that uh, to play through it, you had to put tokens in after every quarter of the game. So people were maybe dropping out after the third quarter if they were uh, too far ahead or too far behind. And they added this feature specifically to address this problem called computer assistance, which keeps the game close. And they probably tweaked some of the uh, likelihoods of a basket getting scored, for example, by the uh, winning team and maybe increasing the likelihood of a basket by the losing team. And maybe the computer players got a little bit better and it would always keep the score uh, very close to increase excitement, as they say, and higher earnings from the tests that they ran on this feature before the game was fully released. Because remember, uh, for an arcade operator, you have limited square footage and you have to pay a lot of money to either rent or buy these arcade cabinets. So if you could guarantee them that they'll make more money, uh, you'll certainly maybe be more inclined to invest in an NBA Jam cabinet. So they were very focused on the addictiveness of the game and the emotions that people might experience while playing the game in an effort to get more quarters out of their pocket. And this was just built right into it, right, into, in, right in the 90s, because they had the ability to start looking at these analytics. Now, what's interesting is Mark Turmel, the guy that uh, was the lead developer on this project, who was interviewed in that podcast interview, now works for Zynga, the mobile developer. And he was very upfront and honest about how he uh, took a lot of what he learned trying to make games addictive in the video arcade over to the mobile app side. And he, sp he says he spends a lot of his time now developing uh, mobile games that women like to play and trying to figure out ways to get them to stay in the game and buy, buy, buy uh, additional play time. So this is probably nothing new, uh, but it certainly had its inspiration in the arcade era and NBA Jam was a great example of how they put all this together. And incidentally, I just happened to listen to this interview last week, right after we were done talking about uh, the Lemmings game here. It's kind of funny how things always coalesce around what's on your mind, the power of suggestion, if you will. But I I thought this interview was very interesting and you should definitely check it out. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And our first question comes in from Rick Hello via the Facebook group. Hello, Rick. Uh, he's curious about the MacBook Pro that I use for my editing and other things. I bought this uh, right when it came out about two years ago now. And he's curious what the uh, long-term review of it is because I usually review things and we never kind of revisit them again unless there's something drastically wrong with them. Uh, and you might recall there was something drastically wrong with this particular device because when I bought it and installed Windows via Boot Camp on it, because I do like to run Windows from time to time on my Macs, uh, there was a driver issue from Apple that physically blew out the speaker. So my first purchase of this computer was replaced by the one I have now. They basically did a, you know, a swap out thing for me to give me a new working computer. So that was the first problem I ran into with it. Uh, the second issue I've had with this particular computer is that I had to get the uh, Thunderbolt ports replaced on it. All four of them uh, essentially failed and that things got so loose, if I would just nudge the computer a little bit, it would disconnect my drives. Uh, they fixed that under warranty. It took about a week or so. Uh, they sent back the same computer I had, but it looked a lot cleaner. <laughs> it's a kind of a mess right now. Um, so that was another issue that I had with it. But I haven't had any real problems since then, except for, of course, the keyboard on it. Uh, the keyboard on these MacBooks is a mess. It's a mess on this one. Uh, it is a mess on my little 12-inch MacBook. My wife has a MacBook Pro, a 13-inch that I got her about a year or two ago. That keyboard is a mess too. We're going to be uh, one at a time uh, taking advantage of Apple's uh, keyboard replacement program that's out there. If you've got one of these devices, and this goes all the way back to 2015, uh, I would suggest you take advantage of this because they will fix them even if they're out of warranty because they've identified that these keyboards are just terrible. And no matter how many Macs I've encountered with this keyboard, I have yet to see one that actually works correctly. Uh, the jury's still out on whether or not the changes that they made will uh, make any real difference here, but I would have preferred to have a slightly thicker MacBook with the old keyboard over uh, what they gave me here because this keyboard has been a disaster. Uh, you know, this stays up in my kitchen. It gets a lot of dust and crumbs and stuff on it sometimes, and uh, it was never a problem on the old one, but this one just, it can't deal with any bit of dirt. Even a grain of sand that gets under that key is going to mess it up. And sometimes the keys will unfreeze, but on mine here, my space bar uh, is kind of messed up. My wife's arrow keys are completely useless. And we're, again, we're going to be swapping these things out one at a time. He also asked about the touch bar. I rarely use it. 
Um, it's up here right now on Keynote. So it does deliver some kind of gee whiz neat features, but generally I don't use it. Uh, I kind of not, I don't like having a uh, touch uh, panel for my escape key also, which is kind of annoying. So I really would have preferred just a standard set of keys up here. Um, the touch bar really doesn't provide any value to me at all. Um, it's kind of a gimmick, and I, if, if it would have resulted in a less expensive MacBook, I would have opted for the one without the touch bar. It's kind of a pointless exercise here. And Rick also asked about the uh, trackpad itself, and that's one thing I really like about Apple products is that they have nailed the touchpad and uh, have really figured out what is a true key press versus what might just be a wrist resting on it. I have rarely had any problems with this huge trackpad here. Uh, accidentally picking something up that I did not intend to do. Uh, we see the same good behavior on iPads as well, and Apple, I think, is really uh, the best at this uh, capacitive touch technology. They really know what you're looking to do, and rarely do I get an errant click or anything like that. They did a very nice job with that. Uh, he also wants to know about thermal throttling. I don't see too much with this. I know there were some issues with the uh, new MacBook Pros with the i9 processor. I'm sure I'm throttling at some point or another if I'm really whacking it with some video editing or whatever, but generally I'm not gaming on this thing and my videos are relatively short, so I haven't seen anything where uh, thermal issues become a problem on the device here. It seems to be uh, functioning fairly well. It's running, to me at least, as well as it did about two and a half years ago when I bought it. And the only reason why I bought it was that I was starting to uh, get some 4K video ingested into my workflow and it was killing my old 2012 MacBook Pro. I would have probably still been using that one today if it was not for uh, the 4K video editing problem. This one uh, does it just fine and for my purposes, the uh, laptop here is more than adequate for that. I really like these uh, USB-C Thunderbolt ports. It's nice to have a laptop with four uh, full-blown Thunderbolt ports on it, and despite the fact that you do have to have dongles a lot of the time, uh, it really is a flexible thing to just have ports that can be anything. So if I want to flip the laptop around and plug power back in, I can just pop it into another one of the ports on here. That works fine. Uh, upstairs in my uh, secondary office that I'm setting up, I'd like to get a little change of pace every once in a while. I've got a Thunderbolt 3 dock up there, and I just plug in a single cable. It delivers power uh, to the laptop here, and the monitor comes up, and everything just starts working without uh, any problems at all. I've been really pleased with uh, Thunderbolt in general, and very much uh, pleased with the fact that this computer has so many useful ports on it. And I did find a lot of USB-C cables that uh, mitigated the need to have an additional dongle. So I've got a bunch of cables that convert USB 3 to USB-C, for example. So external hard drives and all that kind of stuff just seems to uh, be a non-issue for me. And that, uh, to me, has been a big plus for me is uh, having the port flexibility on this device, especially given that this particular laptop is uh, traveled with. Uh, it is brought all over the house. When I've got a, a remote shoot, if I do something like that, it comes with me for that. So uh, having that port flexibility has been really good on here. And whenever you need more ports, you can just bring a dock along with you and you're good to go with more. And it looks like Rick is getting a twofer this week because he's also in this next slide. I didn't realize that when I was putting everything together here. Uh, this is in regards to uh, future-proofing a Chromebook. He's not sure why he would spend six or seven hundred dollars on a Chromebook that might only be supported for six years or less, depending on uh, when exactly in that product's life cycle he bought it. He thinks eight years would be better. Uh, Fayum here has a similar point in that it's kind of crazy to throw perfectly good laptops into the uh, landfill if they're still perfectly functional after six years or so. He thinks they should mandate 10 years or more of software support. And this really speaks to the heart of the issue that's been bugging me about these end of life discussions we've been having over the last couple of weeks here on the wrap up. If the laptop still works, it's kind of lousy that there's no more support for it, even though it's possible to support it. Uh, that's the one advantage I think that Windows laptops bring into the mix because so long as your computer can run the operating system, it will be supported. You might have to upgrade from Windows 7 to 10. I know a lot of people aren't crazy about doing that, but the fact is you can get Windows 10 to work on a 10-year-old computer and you can still continue chugging away with your old hardware. Uh, platforms that have the whole stack under the control of the manufacturer, like 
Apple or like to some degree the Google Chromebooks are under kind of a different scenario here. And I think laptops just last longer these days. Computers just last longer because the demands on the hardware are not what they used to be. I remember upgrading from my 486 to a Pentium. It was like a game changer and we were only looking at about a two or three year period of time here. I don't get that same feeling when I upgrade from uh, my old MacBook on screen here to this one. It didn't feel all that much faster. The only thing the new one did better was handle that 4K video. And like I said, that old MacBook is still being used here to edit video on this channel. It is perfectly functional uh, almost seven or eight years after I bought it. And I think it's kind of lousy that we're going to have really nice computers that are kind of useless to some degree after six and a half years, especially when they're not getting the software and security updates that they need to keep them safe. So I think we need to have a broader discussion in the industry about the lifespan of our devices and the fact that they are going to be very functional perhaps a decade after you bought them. Now this last question comes in from Tom B related to VPNs. And I have talked for many years now about doing a VPN video and I haven't really done one. And I wanted to get some feedback from all of you because Tom was looking for something simple that uh, he can set up and get working. And in this instance, we're talking about setting up your own VPN uh, on your home network that you can access remotely. So I have that on mine. So if I am away somewhere and I'm on public Wi-Fi, I can actually connect over to my home internet with an encrypted connection uh, and basically access the internet through my home connection wherever I am in the world. And that also gives me the side benefit of getting access to all of the stuff inside my network uh, when I'm remote as well. You can really get a lot of use out of a VPN, but again, they're not easy to set up. Now, some routers have a VPN function built in, uh, but not everybody has the same router, which makes making a video about this rather difficult because I wanna be able to uh, show you an experience that everyone can share. Uh, my pick, if you're looking for a very simple VPN router, uh, is likely the Synology routers. They really do have a nice VPN interface. And if you want something really, really simple, uh, I would look at the Amplify Teleport. Uh, this is something we reviewed about a year ago now, and it's a hardware solution. So what you do is you pair up this uh, little teleport module with your router when you're home. It's got to work with their Amplify router. And then when you're out of the house, you plug that little teleport module into an outlet, you connect over Wi-Fi to it, and then it just tunnels you right back home and there's no configuration at all. It's really easy. And we had a very good experience with this when we tested it. Uh, so that might be a little too simple for some people, but I think for a lot of folks who just want that connection without any problems whatsoever, uh, the Amplify Teleport really works very well, even though it is a hardware solution uh, all the way through. But one thing I was contemplating, and I wanted to get some feedback from all of you, is maybe doing a video on Pi VPN, which turns your Raspberry Pi into an open VPN server. So you can open up a port, point that port at the Raspberry Pi, and it will manage the VPN for you. And that would be something I could demonstrate because it would be the same experience for everybody that tries it. And I'd love to hear from you in my uh, Q&A for you this week as to whether or not that's the solution we should look at doing a video about because this would help uh, instruct some other things that I've been thinking about doing and haven't really gotten to just because, again, everyone's VPN experiences are going to depend on what their router can support. Uh, but if we can find something that makes it rather simple to set up a VPN, then this might be the way to go. Let me know down in the comments below. So this week on the channel, we've got a couple of fun things to take a look at. The first is the Lenovo Smart Tab. This is an Android tablet, but it is paired up with the speaker dock, and it turns it into an Amazon Echo device. So you've got the uh, display-driven Echo functionality along with an Android device running it, and I'm curious to see how Android apps might work with this, because one of the issues I've had with the smart displays we've looked at, both the ones from Google and the ones from Amazon, is that you don't have an app universe to play with, so if you wanted to pull up your favorite TV app, you can't. Uh, this one might provide that functionality, so I'm very eager to see uh, how this one comes together, so stay tuned for that. It'll probably be up a little later in the week. I also got in a new 27-inch display from Dell. This is a 1440p display, so not a 4K, and it looks like it's got barely any bezels on it. We'll see exactly whether or not the monitor actually looks like this when we take it out of the box a little bit later this week as well, so stay tuned for that. 
And I'm going to have another production video this week. I know a subset of the audience is always into how I operate here on the channel. We're going to be taking a look at the Bird Dog, which you can see on screen here, which is another device that will take HDMI video and convert it to Nutex NDI standard. What's cool about NDI is that once you get video into some kind of NDI device, that video is available on your network. And it's like having a network video capture device. It is a very flexible protocol. In fact, the bird dog right there on screen is driving the presentation from my Mac today. Uh, the Mac is outputting its video via HDMI to the bird dog, and that's feeding into my TriCaster. But I could boot up OBS and grab that video just the same way. It's an amazing protocol. Uh, this device is similar to the Nutex Spark, which I have right over here uh, that we looked at about a year or two ago. Uh, the Bird Dog has slightly better video quality, and we'll talk about the differences between this one and uh, the Bird Dog device in that video. I actually shot it already. We just have to edit a bunch of stuff together, so that should be showing up a little bit later this week as well. And of course, you never know what might uh, find its way to the studio too in the course of the week. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. Every little bit helps, and it goes towards uh, paying the staff that helps bring more and more video to you every week. We also have more channels you can watch. We've got my extras channel at lon.tv slash extras. We have my podcast at lon.tv slash podcast for an audio version of this show and some of the other interviews that I do from time to time. We have my snippets channel at lon.tv slash snippets where you can find uh, portions of this show that I break out into shorter segments to make it easier to share and to find. And we have my live stream archive at lon.tv slash live streams. And that was one of the things I might do later this week is another live stream with the Mr. Project, that little FPGA computer we were playing with about two weeks ago. I've got a few more things that I want to try out with it. So stay tuned. That might be coming up this week if I get a free moment or two. Uh, and if not, we'll definitely get to it in the next two weeks or so. And if you like what I do, I suggest you hit that notification bell so when I do go live or do anything, you will find out about uh, what I am up to. That's a good thing to do there. And if you want to engage with the channel, we have some other ways you can. Uh, Lon.tv slash email is my very occasional email list. If I've got something really cool coming up, I will notify you about it on there. We have my Facebook uh, page at Lon.tv slash Facebook where we put some of the video from here over there. Uh, we also have my Facebook group at lon.tv slash Facebook group where you can interact with other members of the channel like Rick a little bit earlier. And we have uh, over 600 people there now. So it's growing, We've got a lot of great discussions going on there. And what I love about it is that everybody can talk with each other. A lot of times in the comment threads on YouTube, uh, you can sometimes have a conversation with folks, but it gets buried. It doesn't work all that great as a conversational tool. Uh, the Facebook group, I think, works a little bit better for that kind of thing. So if you're interested in meeting fellow viewers and chatting with me a little bit, you can hang out in there. And then we have my store at lon.tv slash store where I sell devices that I have previously reviewed here on the channel at a pretty good price. And you can get notified every time I add something to the store at lon.tv slash store alert. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Keep those questions and comments coming down below in the video comments section. And until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the lon.tv supporters including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, The Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.